Ken Peek, uh, soon to be uh, Professor Emeritus, University of Nevada, Reno. Um, Crawford County native, <clears throat> born here in uh, Girard, and uh, uh, attended Pitt State University, Kansas University, <clears throat> Police Department, uh, Pittsburgh Police Department, uh, worked at Pitt State for a number of years as an academic there. Um, wound up in Nevada quite a few years ago, and uh, we'll get into how this project unfolded in a little bit, but that's that's kind of a thumbnail sketch, and uh, uh, I'm privileged. I might, we just had our 50th high school reunion in Girard this weekend, and I'm privileged to have a number of my classmates in the audience today, so I appreciate them coming here. Um, <clears throat> So that's, that's a little bit of a thumbnail sketch, you know, uh, 67 years of life in about 30 seconds. <laughs> uh, well, I think like most people in, who grew up in Crawford County, <clears throat> we, I grew up hearing about bootlegging that had occurred here. And, and um, uh, my grandfather was born in 1898, lived in Arma most of his life, but was in World War I, and I used to love to, you might say, sit at his knee and listen to the stories about the hauling ice from house to house, the cakes of ice, and World War I, and bootlegging, and, and so we, we all kind of grew up <coughs> hearing about it, and, and uh, one day I was teaching criminal justice at, at, at Pitt State, uh, for Wichita State. It was an outreach off-campus program, and, and a professor of history, uh, director of the Center for Great Plains Studies at Emporia State, came, came out to campus and was, was uh, kind of just asking around Russ Hall why nothing had ever been written about it. <clears throat> so to make a long story short, he and I sat down in my home in Girard, and uh, we hatched a plot uh, whereby I, because I was here on the ground, so to speak, uh, would do the, boot, the, the bootlegging interviews and some of the, uh, the the grunt work that was involved here. He, being from Emporia, would do the art and being more, you know, uh, uh, technically a his, historic history professor, would do the archival work, you know, the white gloves and all that in Topeka. <laughs> so that's how it came to pass. And so I would, I spent the entire summer of 1983 interviewing old bootleggers and a few law enforcement types. They were all in their 70s and 80s. Mm -hmm. um, obviously, the timing was very propitious, you might say. Um, uh, none of them would speak for the record. They were still afraid of the long arm of the law 50 years <laughs> later or whatever. And, and uh, um, I then spent 200 hours uh, in front of the the newspaper microfilm at the Gerard Press, and I'll explain why that was so key here in a little bit. Um, <clears throat> I even, you know, here's your, your small town. You couldn't do this anywhere, probably. I had my own key to the library. I was free to come and go as I wished, and uh, I think Eileen Reby was the librarian at the time, and, and so I pretty much had to run the place weekends and nights when I needed to do my research, and, and so 200 hours there. Then another 200 hours was involved in going through the Crawford County Courthouse District Court records, the big thick ledgers that show everything that ever happened to anybody who was charged. And, and uh, I might say that uh, uh, much of the, uh, uh, here's the book, The End Result, Kansas Bootleggers on the one hand, and, and uh, I'm flipping through district court records, the big thick ledger books, and here are uh, search warrants falling out on the floor, uh, commitment orders, and we'll talk about that later, but it, that, was, that was very helpful also. Um, and I might say that while doing all of that, um, uh, I discovered that there was a lot of temperance activity going on, and of course we're part of the Bible Belt, and a lot of, a lot of dry activity, and, and uh, they're sort of intermingled. You can't really understand one without understanding the other. The bootlegging and temperance, and most of you have heard about Carrie Nation and, and uh, Francis Willard and, and Susan B. Anthony, all of their work, and, and so that kind of hand in glove, and so seven years later I went back and revisited those, those uh, <clears throat> newspaper microfilm, had them sent out to me one at a time from Pitt State, went through it all again, and came up with this temperance book. Uh, so that's sort of how it, how it unfolded, and, and I might add that because of my connections in Crawford County, 
uh, my living in Girard and people pretty well knowing my family, uh, we've been there forever. And, and then my, my in-laws lived in our Arcadia area. And then growing up in Pittsburgh, it was, really was pretty easy to get, get a foot in the door. In fact, people were calling me. I understand you're doing a book. I, here's somebody you ought to talk to, or I have information. And, and uh, it really, you know, I was just running wild the whole summer of, of 83 seeing people. I found a few old police types, one guy down in Atlantic in Missouri, and, and went down and visited with him. Now, for the most part, then, they didn't want to use their names, but a few people did, and I'll, I'll mention them. So as we did go through, just um, bear in mind that there may be maybe some, some kinds of questions that can't be answered because I've sworn an oath uh, many years ago to not. Uh, uh, somewhere here they have it. These were the old reel to reel uh, tape recordings. I would just uh -huh. set that up and go. There was only one, one occasion where I felt a little bit threatened, and it wasn't because of the person being interviewed per se. It was some of her family members who were afraid I was going to get her into trouble, I guess, and it was in a rough part of the county. and. And uh, so, other than that, it was very open and gracious. The very first interview I did, and probably one of the very best, was about one fourth of a mile from here down the road. And, and that gentleman did give me his name, allow me to use his name. I want to say, too, that, that I think I really appreciate <clears throat> the efforts of the museum to, to do this because this is a a major part of Crawford County and Kansas history that I'm afraid is sort of falling into, you know, ancient history. You don't hear much much talk about it anymore. And and I really I'm really thankful that, that you're doing this and keeping it alive and have the videotape available and so forth. Let me just say, uh, John Sigley, who lived at the end, uh, came here from the old country and and uh, he was my first interviewee and. And I uh, got a good interview. That, this really was a good one to get, get the project launched. He uh, drew a still for me on a piece of legal pad and uh, kind of a rough, rough drawing. But if, if, if in the automotive world, John would have been a Rolls Royce. His, his, his boot, his, his, his moonshine was the best. Uh, he he, he uh, took great pride in what he did. We'll talk about it a little later, but there were a lot of like the drug business, there are a lot of rip-offs, a lot of people, a lot of this stuff would make somebody blind if you didn't know what you were buying or drinking and, and uh, so forth. John drew this, this, this uh, still for me. Um, I sent it up to Dr. O'Brien up at Emporia State, and he said, you know, I, I'm not sure this will work. I, uh, I want to send it over to the chemistry department. So he sent it over to the chemistry department, and it comes back in a week or two, and, and uh, he asked him, will this, will this produce moonshine? And they said, that'll make darn good moonshine. <laughs> so <laughs> so that, that got us going, and, uh, and as they say, from, from then on, it, it, it just unfolded. I interviewed, uh, I might just describe a few people who are notable in this regard. We had a, uh, a gentleman who lived in Girard who who operated a hardware store. And amazingly enough, I'll, even though for 68 years in Kansas it was illegal to manufacture, possess, or sell intoxicating liquors, you could walk into any hardware store and over in the corner would be everything you needed to set up your still. <laughs> uh, we call, I think, pandering, and I, I compare that many years later to the head shops we have today. You know, you're not supposed to use the, the drugs, but here's everything you need. To, uh, so you could walk in, and there would be your charcoal lined barrels, and there would be your coils, and there would be your alcohol tester, there would be your electric needle to zap it with, give it that nice Jim Beam color, and uh, everything you needed. Uh, so people profited off of this, and even though it was illegal all those years. So uh, I, I visited with him. Uh, there was a nurse who I, I was uh, referred to, whose husband was a her husband was an MD. Uh, down around the Corona area, a real rough, real rough, a big still down there, and they would, of course, have occasionally have an explosion, and uh, uh, she would have to ride down. She said they would be met um, with people in, with shotguns, and they were to ride the, uh, uh, the running board of the pickup down on into the, where the still was located um, to, to do the medical work they needed to do. 
and uh, it, they would the, these these uh, people would all always pay in cash. It would always be wrapped in a handkerchief. Oftentimes, they'd offer to pay her with chickens and pigs and cows too, <laughs> for, uh, which I don't think they hardly ever took. Kansas came into the Union in January of 1869 and without any prohibitory amendment. Um, so we're on the tail end of the Civil War. We've got Civil War veterans coming in. Uh, we've, got, we've got gamblers and <clears throat> prostitutes and drug uh, 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 gamblers and, um, well, everything was, was, was uh, uh, it was pretty rough. And at about the time that was going on in the 1870s, down in what was called Short Creek near Galena, uh, lead and zinc happened to be discovered. And uh, believe it or not, at one time, 500,000 pounds of lead was being taken out down there. Well, you know what, it, it just boomed town. Everything sprung up overnight and the population and, and the houses and whatever. It was a rough area though, really, really rough and tumble. And so, you know, booze made its, made its, its appearance early on. You, and you might be interested to know that there are about 225 references to, to wine in the Bible. I mean, Bible, wine and, and alcohol has always been part of our, our, our livelihood, our, our, uh, our lifestyle. So people came here and they wanted to have a good time. It was a rough scrabble living and hard times. And so, as we know, they turned to, to drink. Mm -hmm. And bear in mind, too, that to have a saloon, all you had to have were two barrels and a and, and a plank, a wooden plank, and you got a saloon. <laughs> and we know too that the saloon, you know, was, was a, as many as later on in our society, I guess, a, kind of a focal point for the community. It was also the post office, a place to drink, uh, but you could go there and buy buy postage stamps and everything else you needed, and and uh, really a, a kind of a civic civic uh, the, the center of the civic life of many of these places. So. That's kind of what set the stage in the 1870s, actually in the 1850s, we began to see temperance organizations forming in the country, and we began to see them here in Crawford County because of the lifestyle, all the, all the uh, alcoholic activities that were going on. And um, so we had the International Order of Good Templars. Some of you may remember the Murphys, the Murphyites. They wore the blue ribbon and took a pledge and all of that sort of thing. And, and of course, women's groups. And, and, uh, and I'd like to point out that um, women were very severely affected by this, this bootlegging lifestyle and the whole drinking culture because you, know, you didn't have welfare. You didn't have aid to dependent children and all those kinds of things. And, and if the husband got injured, permanently disabled, or died in a coal mine, you had to do something to eat, and you, you know you couldn't you couldn't live off a garden and a few cows, and and so everything was sort of tailor made for people to start cooking whiskey. I also would point out um, <clears throat> you can't talk about this without referring to the uh, the term Balkans, and and uh, there there are let, if I may just um, digress for just a moment. Um, there are about four different variations or, or explanations for the term Balkans. And of course, we're talking, I want to say this, the, the, the old, the old uh, adage was there were 104 counties in Kansas plus Crawford County. All right, maybe <laughs> everything was different here. All the rules yeah. were different here. And that, that changed everything as well. And the, uh, the, 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 uh, Dr. Bill Powell, one of my, one of my former colleagues at Pitt State, of course, has written very, very well about the coal mining and the, the immigration, immigrants, the migrant people migrating here. And, and I talked to a number of bootleggers who came here from the so-called old country, from Italy primarily, um, came here in wooden shoes. They couldn't speak the language, and, and, and it was tough. It was very difficult for those folks. So it, the word Balkans is uh, given several different explanations. It could have been in the, the Balkans were, it was an area in Europe, the southeast, southeastern part of Europe, a lot of unrest, a lot of diversity. Mm -hmm. Everything was different there in the Balkans of southeastern Europe. 
and we think maybe that was just a term that was that was borrowed here. I want to read this just a little, a few snippets out of out of this book, and I would attribute this to Fred Brinkerhoff, who was a, an editor of the Pittsburgh High, uh, Headlight, and he wrote this in 1962. He said, if you look on the map for the Kansas Balkans, you will not find them. If you look in Kansas history, you cannot miss them. <laughs> Years ago, a wisecracking journalist mixing realism and imagination produced a name which has a geographical connotation. It was a philosophy of conduct, a program of activity, uh, and he goes on to talk about in southeastern Europe, a group of small states was constantly disturbing the peace of Europe, and uh, the Balkans countries let the world know they were there. In Kansas, the southeastern corner counties, some of them had problems that, that did not yield to conventional treatment or solution. So that's, you know, there's an easy correlation there, I think, why, how we got to be known as the Balkans. And, and I don't know how often that, ter you probably use that term a lot around here in the museum, but, but I just want to make, everything was different here. Um, 104 counties plus Crawford County. So <laughs> that sort of sets the table for, um, uh, I also want to point out, I would be very remiss if I didn't mention, in terms of talking about the activities leading to an 1880s constitutional amendment, there was a Dr. William Warner, um, who was born in Ohio in 1820. He became, went to, to medical school there, and uh, uh, during the Civil War, he served with the Union. Uh, <clears throat> after the war, he came to Baxter Springs and, and practiced medicine there. Uh, then he, he became part owner of a Fort Scott newspaper uh, in the uh, late 1860s and ultimately moved, they moved the whole newspaper to Girard, which became, of course, the Girard Press. Uh, Dr. Warner was the editor-in-chief from 1869 to 19, 1872, uh, and just a major force. Even after he stepped aside, he contributed art. If you want to see some really beautiful writing, but you, people who could snip someone to ribbons with words, <laughs> that's, where you, that's where you look. And I, uh, Dr. Warner was just phenomenal, and he was a major voice in for the for for the prohibitory movement uh, throughout all of Kansas, and probably had a lot to do with Kansas becoming dry in 1880. Um, so, in fact, he was such a major voice that the Girard Press was burnt to the ground in 1871 uh, because he just people got tired of listening to him. And, and I want to say too, anybody here who has a historical bent, it, it takes a lot of time and effort. But imagine. I'm tippy-toeing down to the, to the Gerard Press and going through the microfilm, but if you really, you know, you want to get your hands into the dirt, so to speak, into, into the, the, real, the real history of this area, I was able to watch Gerard spring up out of the dust and read about them building wooden sidewalks around the town square and the square prop, uh, popping up and the, uh, ultimately the, the courthouse being built, the laws that needed to be passed. and. Uh, that, that really is, it's a powerful experience to watch something just come out of nothing. And, of course, we know the story about how uh, it was named, that the deer shot on the square, suppose, all of that. But, um, and the major families whose, whose uh, descendants still live today, they're building homes and opening businesses. And, and that was a very powerful experience. You just don't get a better sense of history than going to the old newspapers and so forth. But, but Dr. Warner was the most vigorous uh, writer, uh, proponent of, uh, of, of prohibition and, and uh, a, a prohibitory amendment of anyone. And, and he's buried in Girard Cemetery even today. So um, uh, that's kind of how, how this began. <laughs> Kansas became the first state in the Union to have, as part of a state constitution, a prohibitory liquor law. Now, Maine, the state of Maine, in 1851 had enacted a, a statewide law, but that's not, a, you know, frankly, not, not nearly as significant. We had it in, in our state constitution. You know, you can get where I come from now in Nevada. There are 63 people combined, combined in the, in the the, the state's Senate and Assembly, 
And, you know, it doesn't take many people to pass a state law. But to get a state constitutional amendment enacted, uh, there had to be a, a, a two-thirds vote on the part of this Kansas House and then the Senate. And there's a lot of drama connected with that. I won't get into it, but, but it's described in my temperance book. A lot of drama. One guy was a holdout. He was a deciding vote. And the story goes that nobody knew what to do. We're going to go down in flames. His wife came down out of the upper chamber, walks down onto the house floor, whispers something in his ear. His vote changed immediately. <laughs> in history, it will never know what she said to him, but you can use your own imagination. But so the Senate and House uh, in 1879, uh, two-thirds of both houses voted to put it on the statewide ballot. And then uh, the citizens of Kansas voted 92,300 roughly in favor, 84,300 roughly against. So they had the majority and Kansas became under a state constitution. There was 21 words. 21 words in our Constitution changed the law and legally the drinking habits of Kansas for what would be, be a 68 year period until 1948. So that that's, you know, there, by the way, I might mention that my son Jason and I, um, um, he's an attorney, uh, later on would, would we did a, a publication in Kansas history it looks like it's summer of 2006, just on the various ways people try to get around that prohibitory law. Um, I might I may discuss a few of them. Um, first of all, they had to define what 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 is alcohol. This Kansas Supreme. And by the way, we have a picture of one David Brewster here who would go on from the Kansas Supreme Court to become a, a member of the United States Supreme Court. A colleague of mine at University of Nevada, Reno, um, um, <clears throat> has written an article about him. His name is Michael Broad, Dr. Michael Broadhead, and uh, he's published a, a book about him, I should say. David Brewer was a major force on the court here and wrote hundreds and hundreds of opinions on the U.S. Supreme Court as well. But what is, what is alcohol? How do you know alcohol when you see it? And that was a fundamental question that came to the Kansas Supreme Court. Well, and, and don't forget, we had people, um, I should emphasize, I'm trying to flip pages here, we had people trying to get around the law by, by serving cider, prickly bitters, um, Jamaica rum and rye and very, well, they tried to say, wait a minute, this, and I should say, when, when Kansas enacted its law in 1880, the major problem then that developed was how are we going to enforce this thing? How do you enforce this law? Um, and again, the Kansas Supreme Court had to deal with a whole number of ways people were trying to get around the law. Um, uh, is cologne, lots of things contain alcohol. Is cologne an alcoholic beverage? Well, the court had to say, wait a minute, if it's used as an intoxicant, you know, kind of a social drink, it's within the law. If not, it's outside. But a lot of times that line was kind of blurred, you know, and um, uh, we had people opening up social clubs. I'm not selling beer or alcohol. I'm just letting people bring it in, and I keep it for them, and they drink it themselves while well, a guy gets, gets arrested. Is he in violation of the law? Um, yes, he was, by the way. Um, <laughs> we had people shipping illegal booze in from outside the state coming in or or traveling salesmen bringing it in are they in violation well in the case of of, of uh, you can, the court said you can't interfere with interstate commerce that's all right it was okay to bring it in but you weren't supposed to use it once you got here <laughs> um, all kinds of things like that and uh, you know different ways of trying to get around the law that the court had to deal with That allowed that only druggists could 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 dispense alcohol, alcoholic beverage, for either medicinal or mechanical uh, 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 uses. Anybody, if you could get 12 people to sign a petition or an, an oath saying you you are of good moral character, and you could put up a $2,500 bond 
you became a druggist. You, and that was, that was the largest loophole in the law and the biggest problem, caused the biggest problems for enforcement. Before long, Kansas had 2,000 outlets. <laughs> for, and let me tell you, people were getting sick for every reason under the sun. <laughs> Diarrhea, you know, I got boils. One woman went in and, and they were supposed to sign their name and what, what, what medical problem they had. And, and I read where one woman wrote down something and she changed it to say, well, I'm, I'm boiling pickles. And, uh, you know, it, that was... And, the, and the, the, one of the challenges to the law that the Kansas Supreme Court had to deal with was, was that. What, and that had to be issued by a probate judge, by the way. You, you, you went into the probate judge with your, your $2,500 in your names, and some people thought that was sort of a, a you know, that, 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 didn't, that wasn't a, a good system. But, but the Supreme Court said, yeah, that's okay. That's what the legislature intended, and, and that's how it worked. But... Um, that was that was the the first major obstacle to Kansas being dry was that anybody could could <laughs> just about become a you know, basically a dram shop and and so um, don't forget too uh, I should say that Pittsburgh which was known as New Pittsburgh uh, in its early days uh, was always wet and. Uh, uh, re really a thorn in the side of people like Dr. Warner and all these, these temperance groups and whatnot. Pittsburgh was taking uh, money under the, the city of Pittsburgh was taking money under the table uh, from all the saloonists in the area and granting them business licenses uh, and looking the other way in violation of the law. That would go to the Kansas Supreme Court and, and uh, uh, but they a lot of communities depended on those licenses from the saloonists to keep their police departments and other services going. Um, the Missouri influence, you can't, it, it's, Missouri's always been a thorn in, 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 and even when I was a Pittsburgh police officer in the, in the 70s here, uh, if we wanted to, we could catch people driving in from Missouri. If that, if that fifth of bourbon had a Missouri stamp on it, we were to arrest them. Uh, we didn't, but uh, but that's that's uh, that, it, it, Missouri was always a thorn in our side. So just a lot of things frustrated, you know, the, the whole enforcement process. And uh, we had some a band of people. Uh, we had a county attorney named Carl C A R L A A H Carl. I think in the book it says A K, but I believe his real name was A H initials. But he formed something called Carl's Raiders that were out of Mulberry, but he hired people. They didn't get paid a salary, but they got paid on the, 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 the uh, numbers of arrests they made. And, and he was running around trying to, trying to uh, and, and they were very successful. The problem is he got, apparently got greedy and, and uh, was doing some things for three or four reasons. He was, he was ousted from office and uh, uh, did some jail time himself. We had a fella, everybody, everybody I talked to interviewed um, talked about Snake Thompson and he's mentioned in the book. Snake Thompson was a federal revenuer who drove people nuts. He was very, very aggressive, kind of like, uh, uh, you know, the, uh, uh, what, uh, the, the Elliot Ness, you know, on a federal level or whatever, but uh, he ran around here making people's lives pretty miserable and I can, I can tell you he, he sent a lot of people away. Um, uh, so Snake was, 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 was mean. He would, he would chase people no matter where they were. And so uh, you, you, we'll talk about it a little bit later when we get into the bootlegging lifestyle, but they, there are pretty innovative ways of get, hiding this stuff, eluding the law. But again, we had some pretty aggressive people. I heard, though, about, I was told many times about, and I'm not going to mention names, but there were sheriffs, county attorneys, and again, mayors and city council who were who were happy to look the other way, and and they lined their pockets. Frankly, there was one official, county official, who was known as Five Dollar a Barrel Joe. That's not his real name, but you know, for five dollars a barrel, you could you could run your still. Um, uh, I heard about one law enforcement officer who went into office dirt broke, and when he came out four years later. Everybody in the county owed him money, and he owned three farms. You know, <laughs> um, so that a lot of that going on. That certainly, and I would. Uh, many years later, I happened to talk to a fellow who 
resided here and was laying carpet in that particular sheriff's house. And the sheriff was sitting there, long ago retired sheriff, sitting there in his in his in his chair while the fellows down there laying carpet. And he began talking about it, and he said, "You know, uh, what, what were we to do? We couldn't put a fence around Crawford County, so I figured I might as well profit a little bit by it along the way." So that's that's kind of what the, that's 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 what was going on. And again, don't forget, these were tough times. People didn't get wealthy making moonshine. They just tried to squeak by. And um, um, maybe now is a good time to say that um, when the feds or the state arrested somebody, someone in the family had to go to jail or go to prison. Um, and imagine this. Mom and dad have a little farm out here in the country. and and. Um, and there's a lot of snitching going on, just like with the drug culture, you know, 100 years later. Uh, I'm in trouble. Well, I'll roll over on my neighbor so I don't get treated so badly. I'll give them up, snitch on them. A lot of snitching going on. Somebody had to go to prison. And the, the authorities, the, the federal or state governments, didn't particularly care who, but somebody had to serve the time. Imagine this, mom and dad talking about it over the kitchen table and and deciding that mom has to go away for a year and a day um, because dad had to stay home and keep the keep the crops going and keep the farm running and the kids going and probably continue to make moonshine mm -hmm. um, so mom would go away to the so-called chicken farm up at lansing uh, i have pictures in the in both books i think the temperance book the bootlegging book these are some of those orders that were falling out on the floor in the, mm -hmm. in the courthouse uh, commitment orders sending people off to, to prison and, and again as often as not quite often at least uh, mom would go to, to prison so dad could stay home and keep things going so it was a rough scrabble life and people didn't get rich I know Hollywood has glamorized it quite a lot and and uh, whatnot but it, it, it was it was a, a, a really really tough biggest loophole at the federal level was that the revenue agents could be appointed. They were political appointees. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Snake Thompson, I mentioned, is kind of an outlier. He was, he was pretty dedicated, and, and the people who worked for him were dedicated. But as we know, um, a, lot of, a lot of people on the take, uh, political appointments and uh, payoffs and graft and corruption. So, Again, a, a major reason why a national prohibition didn't work, it just simply couldn't be enforced. And nobody really wanted to enforce it all that, all that strenuously, I think. So, um, again, I mentioned A.H. A. A. Carl from Mulberry. Gung-ho, very aggressive for a while, but pretty soon what he was doing was, well, he's taking money from, he's charging, um, uh, he would literally go out and threaten little, little, little senior citizen women with with jail if it didn't pay him a, a fine under the table according to what I've read and uh, he would do things like go out and make a raid and he would leave some booze behind instead of taking it bringing it back he, uh, taking it all in he would then go back the next day or a few a few days later to uh, 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 make another arrest I mean they were doing things that should I should mention <laughs> that um, I really got got uh, very fortunate in the fact that uh, I was given a number of photographs that appear in the book, and and I'm going to send copy to the to the museum here. But you know, again, it wasn't very aggressive here in Crawford County. But once in a while, our law enforcement authorities had to try to convince the public that they were doing their jobs. And so here's the old jail standing over in Girard. It was torn down maybe, what, eight, ten years ago? They would parade out a whole number of, of, of stills, and they got the hatchet marks in them and so forth. But really, I think, and I know a number of these people here that are standing up in front were on the take, uh, because that's what I was told many, many times. And, and it was kind of a ruse. It was sort of a facade to let people think we're, we're doing our job, you know? Uh, but... Uh, again, the whole enforcement thing was, was practically, in the big scheme of things, practically nil. Most 
to these bootlegging operations um, were, were very small, mom and pop kinds of things, trying to squeak by and so forth. Uh, one of the interviewers told us that it may have been illegal, but it wasn't wrong. And, <laughs> and in fact, uh, uh, Dr. O'Brien and, and Barbara Robbins and I had an article in Kansas history in, in winter of 88 and 89 uh, uh, by, that, by that particular title. Just something we decided to do along the way while the book was in progress. And uh, one of the things I, I found, I, I don't know, I guess I could mention this, but it was in a, uh, let me see if it's mentioned by name. Um, well, it isn't, so maybe I, but there was a, a facility, I should, I guess I'll say, down in, in the front neck area where um, uh, there was this still set up in the lobby in, a, in an old car, and, and uh, that's, that's pretty much the way it was. I mean, a small still, not a big operation, and, and uh, 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 that's, we've talked kind of a little bit about that, but I might tell you some of the ways they tried to evade the, uh, the law enforcement people. You had to know where to hide this still, first of all, and and I can tell you that. It, and, and after the after the bootlegging book came out, a number of people said, "Well, you should have talked to me. I could have told you about this." You know, there, yeah. probably three more books could have yeah. been written easily. Just anecdotal information. Uh, a, a member of my family, immediate family, said, "You know, my my dad didn't didn't run a still operation, but." There were five boys in the family, and they were instructed, uh, kind of out by Brazelton area, Hepler, they were instructed periodically to go out, get tree branches, and swish out the wagon tracks that were leading into and out of the, the, the still that was in his pasture. There's your $5 a barrel, <laughs> and people trying to make a buy. So a lot of families were touched by this and trying, to again, to make a few extra dollars. So um, uh, we had... Uh, a lot of innovative ways of trying to hide the stuff. I heard of people, you, know, you had all these, these fence posts, the wooden fence posts. Well, instead of having a maybe a two foot hole in the ground for your fence post, we'll just dig it four feet deep and we'll put two feet, that extra two feet, we'll, we'll stack our jugs of whiskey in. <laughs> and that was what. Another pretty innovative way was um, we've got some animals on the farm and we get some mean ones. Well, we'll put a corn crib in there in, in with the animals and that's where we'll stash our booze in the bottom of that and that kept snake thompson away from he didn't like mean animals and that was one way they kept them out of from from finding their their stash um so they had to get pretty innovative again though a lot of a lot of uh, snitching going on and and you and i had a number of people tell me just again trying to squeak by and make a living keep food, little food on the table much of their profit went to bail out family members or themselves or, or whatever. So it, it, um, I just want to emphasize that. It wasn't, it wasn't something people did to get rich. So um, also I should, should mention that, you know, this, this was good quality stuff. And Deep Shaft, the generic name for Crawford County Moonshine, went everywhere. And I was told a number of times about Al Capone sending runners down to pick it up and go north. Uh, imagine I'm sitting east of the State Park corner uh, over here on 69 Highway and uh, visiting with the fellow in his backyard and um, just as calmly as we're talking now, uh, he said, yeah, he said right next door is the old home place. and." Harry Truman came down to buy, buy uh, uh, moonshine from my dad. Uh, you know, anytime you're doing oral histories like this, you simply have to take people at face value. I have no reason to think he was he was prevaricating. Mm -hmm. I don't think he was like he was he was, and he was his his dad was a fairly big bootlegger and and one of the more innovative, creative ones. He had he had a uh, an earthen basement under the house but he built another hollowed out place under that and that's where his, his still was uh, and where he kept all of his so he had a very well hidden as we all know Harry Truman grew up in Lamar Missouri and then went to Independence and and uh, according to him at least was a fairly you know sometime at least uh, 
uh, client of, of his dad's next door. Um, so <clears throat> it was known as Deep Shaft. There was Corona Rye. Uh, there was uh, 50 Camp. The story was you could go into Chicago and one of the speakeasies and and uh, tell them you wanted some hooch. They would say, "Well, do you want do you want Deep Shaft or 50 Camp?" And then uh, the beer that came out of here was. Um, known as white chalk or Oklahoma chalk. It, uh, uh, of course, the beer wasn't as nearly as plentiful as the, the hard stuff, but uh, it was also known as Jamaica ginger and John Barley corn, old tanglefoot. There are all kinds of names for the, for the hard stuff that came out of this area. So um, uh, the, it, it went far and wide, and, and again, Crawford County was known for, for, for all of it, those bootlegging proclivities, you might say. be comprehensive again we we have to acknowledge that because of the migration here from the Balkans from the uh, from the original Balkans from Europe um, along came that organized crime element it sort of intermingled and um, you know that, that the black hand was here the KKK was here the black hand really wasn't a, a mafia type thing originally but uh, I'm, I'm sure most of you have heard about it I was contacted by an FBI agent some years ago out of Kansas City who uh, had worked organized crime, wanted to know what I, what I had found out as part of research for this about the black hand. Um, and <clears throat> I told him that I, I didn't think there was enough money to be made around here um, uh, for people to pay protection. The black hand was basically, it was, it was uh, in effect a good long while. Um, but let's say mom and pop owned a grocery store somewhere and, and some person organized crime, mafiosi, would want a little easy money. They, you've heard of the protection rackets. Pay me so much a week and nothing will happen to your, your business. Well, if they paid fine, if they didn't, they would go to work, go to the grocery store one day and somebody would have put their hand down in some coal, coal dust, and put the black imprint up on on the door and that was the final warning you better pay up and if you didn't you know bad things could and did happen now we had a little little inkling of that over here by Gerard we had a very aggressive deputy by the name of O.M. Lamb and he he was out making arrest and one night he and his family are are, were asleep in the house and lo and behold he gets blown up but they were dynamited and there was a picture in the book that was provided by a relative of his and Gerard and, and that, that may have been a black hand it's kind of been implied that might have been a black hand operation but I mean very dangerous obviously uh, to deal with these people It's probably let's let me uh, talk a little bit about about uh, national prohibition coming into pa coming to pass and and uh, you know actually we had of course World War One was 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 going on and everybody's uh, cooking a lot of people here at least uh, cooking moonshine and and by the way they put they clamped down on the sugar purchasing that was one way we tried to go after. You could, you could go buy three bushel baskets of peaches, and that was equal to about five pounds of sugar. And then we forced people to sign for it at grocery stores. And a lot of, then along came the war, and uh, the whole nation became concerned about uh, you know, the war effort. We needed to, we needed to feed the troops. And, and actually, uh, wartime prohibition came a few years before national prohibition because you, 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 we needed the, the, the fruits and whatnot for, for that effort. But um, <clears throat> it's, it's one of those kind of long story, but uh, in uh, uh, 1917, 18, 19, um, the country began to realize that we need to do something about this booze problem we've got. Um, the uh, two thirds of both houses of Congress the Senate and the House of Representatives um, voted to put it on the ballot and, and it was well, to submit it to the states, I should say. Three-fourths of the states, there were 48 at the time, 36, had to ratify it. 
and they did. And of course, that was a big day when number 36 came, and then 40 some ultimately ratified it. But uh, the whole nation went dry uh, in, in 1920 and re would remain dry until 1933, of course. Um, but I think that, that probably did nothing but put more money in the pockets of bootleggers and the Al Capones of the world and people like that because now, it's, you know, you got to go underground to get it, mm -hmm. and that's where you're going to go get it. So um, uh, that's, that's sort of uh, it helped it. Kansas legalized beer in 1937, but kept, again, the, the hard liquor uh, illegal until it changed its constitution in 1948. So. Um, Again, as I said, for 68 years, it was legally impossible to, to possess or possess alcohol here. One hundred and four counties plus Crawford <laughs> County. That says it all. Uh, yeah. That everything was different here, and it's got to be kept alive in our history classes. And I know some of you, many in this room, have been history teachers and. Uh, uh, unfortunately, you know, I was very fortunate in terms of timing. We'd heard about it from our grandparents and maybe parents, but now you're talking about, you know, it, those people are, aren't alive to, to, to continue that, that lore and hand it down, and, and uh, it kind of is incumbent upon people like us, the younger generation in the room, to be sure that it does get passed down. So. Thank you.